About 100 top officers, including generals, brigadier generals, uh, air vice marshals, and admirals in the Nigerian Army, Air Force, and Nigerian Navy may proceed on compulsory retirement following the appointment of new service chiefs on Monday by President Bola Tinubu. Aside from the imminent gale of retirement, many officers will be promoted too as part of the organization of the services by the new service chiefs. This is happening six months after 24 major generals and 38 brigadier generals retired last December. Joining us now on the morning show is Major General Henry Ayola, former commander Special Task Force Operation Safe Heaven in Jos Plateau State. Good morning, Major General Ayola, and welcome to the morning show. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning. Good to see you again, I'm sir. Glad to be on Bless set you, sir. this morning. But Thank General, you. General, let's go. Let's cut through the chase. What do you think of uh, President Tinumbu's uh, retirement of the former service generals and uh, service chiefs and his uh, appointment of new ones. What are the implications? Um, what do you think this will do for morale within the uh, military establishment? What will be the effect, particularly with individual careers and collective morale? Thank you very much. That's a germane question. Uh, I don't think there's anything new about that, I'm sure the immediate past service chiefs themselves were expecting it. Uh, it's, a, it's a normal routine, indeed, uh, for this kind of changes to take place once there is a new administration. Usually, uh, within the officer's uh, cadre, we have a joke that you, you know that once your name is on, the, on page one of the seniority list, you know that the next change, you are likely to be out. So you are prepared for it. It's not, uh, it's expected that indeed it's inevitable because once uh, you pick uh, the next service chiefs, those who are senior to them, by the way, most of them are already on their way out. They were already in the departure hall. Uh, so I don't think it took any of them by surprise. Uh, it's been the tradition, it's a tradition all over the world, you know. You, you can't help but do that. Because, you know, in the military, seniority is very strong. So the possibility of uh, having your junior becoming the chief and you want to remain and serve under him, doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work at all. So I don't think there's anything new or strange about it. it it's normal. It's normal routine. And the retirement last December you mentioned, it's also part of routine. You know, as some people are getting out, some new people are getting into the uh, Nigerian Defense Academy, and some are moving out. It's a cyclic thing. It must be that way. If not, the system will be, you know, we get stuck somewhere. You know, so it, it's normal. All right. Uh, Major General Ayola, let's talk about promotions. Obviously, uh, following this new uh, rejigging or reshuffling of service chiefs, there would be promotions. I was speaking to a military personnel yesterday, and what they had talked about is this concept of the politicizing of promotions in the military. What's your take on this? Is this true? Is it true that um, beyond just the rank and file is also a place for lobbying to get a, you know, a good posting or good position, whereby it's not necessarily based on, um, you know, the ranking based on competence, based on how many years. What, what, what do you have to say about this? Yeah, th thank you very much. That's another good question. Uh, I think uh, whoever is saying that obviously does not understand the system. Uh, I think the military is one place where, you know, we can beat our chest as a nation and say, look, this is the last bastion of our unity. Uh, I've not seen that. I've not seen that anywhere. I mean, for the 50 years uh, ago that I started wearing uniform to when I retired to now, when I still follow up what is happening in the military, it's my primary constituency. So at no time have I lost touch with uh, keeping tab. Of course, I have some of my mentees that are still there serving. I think the military system is so structured that uh, what is being insinuated is far from it. Because first and foremost, promotions are based on, first there is the issue of length of time on each rank. 
There are also issues of, there is also a promotion board. There is the issue of merit. Your performance in all your courses are recorded. They are graded. There's also what we call the personal evaluation report that is done annually. All of that counts. So the idea of uh, anybody being favored, even if your father is the president, you can't be promoted ahead of your classmates. It's not possible in our system. And even if you are the smartest officer in the whole wide world, it will have to be a totally unprecedented thing to set, to attempt to promote you ahead of your colleagues or above your seniors. It, it offsets the old systems. We've not had that. Maybe in the 60s, 70s, when you had the generation of senior officers who went to different academies, you know, you know, they were sent to different academies all over the world. Even at that, they still, we still have a way of measuring seniority. That is what we call the antidate or the day you started cadet training. Okay, that is basic, you know. Of course, in their time, maybe due to some political exigencies, you know, some people got, you know, faster promotion to put them in the you know, appropriate appointments they were holding at the time. You know, I mean, like, you know, the head of state at the time was promoted from Lieutenant Colonel to General. Yeah, that had to be done <laughs> if he was going to be head of state. And that was the level of development of the armed forces at that time. But since after those generations, you know, by, by the last, maybe the last part of 70s, we've never had a thing like that. So uh, oh, okay. I, I think the, oh, whoever okay. is insinuating that doesn't understand the system. Okay. Mm. Uh, can you also, I'll also ask you this. Yes. There's also this that we have talked to a couple of people, you know, and in the forces, and they always say that, in fact, when they get to a certain position, and the position that was mentioned was Brig Gen, Brigadier General, most of them try to exit yeah. because they know that the pathway to get into the very top is slim, you know, because certain people are more favored than some. What would you like to say about that? Two, there's also mm, a, convers okay. a conversation. That, that, no, oh, okay. You uh, want very, to go ahead. Two, there's also a conversation I'd like to introduce. And this is my thinking. I'm just thinking. You can call it a phantasmagorical thought or anything. Where do our veterans go when they are finally retired? Is there going to be sort of like a veterans' core? where the bulk of the fighting forces, like people like you, General, that are still looking very fit after service and all of that and strong, can still offer their services to the country in a defined scheme, where they are not totally left out of the, uh, the, the, the force. Because I fear what we lose when we have all these officers leave is institutional memory. And that's fast lacking in our country. You can call my thought phantasmagorical, okay, but I just you. put let it out Let me take those two. Two questions, yes, sir. Okay, let me take those two questions together. The first one uh, about uh, getting to Brigadier General and then moving over and you know, crossing the, the bar to the two-star general. Uh, it, again, it's normal. The, the, the structure is inherently periodical. It's a pyramid. Everybody in the course cannot become a two-star general. We all started from the, when you left the academy as second lieutenant or, you know, uh, midshipman and the flying officer for, you know, for the Air Force and all of that. But as you grow up, the pyramid forms itself. It's, it's inherent. You know, because some we drop at the level of lieutenant, some at the level of captain, some at major and like that. That's how it goes. So it's inherent. It has never happened before that everybody in one course will make major general. It, has, it can't happen. Because even by nature, you know, there are so many vagaries and vicissitudes of life and even the eventualities of the profession and different exposures. The moment you left the academy, you are facing, the, in fact, everybody is on his own track, as it were. You know, so, of course, like I, said, I mentioned earlier, the, the things that determine promotion, they are there for each, from each rank to the next rank. From beginner general to major general, it used to be three years in our time, it's four years now. And so, first of all, you must spend four years at that rank before you are even considered for promotion. And of course, there are all of the other things, your performance in the National Defense College, you know, your performance in the field, 
because you will have been also rated by your immediate commander. If you were a brigade commander somewhere and under a general officer commanding or a corps commander of a corps or something, you, you'll have been, you know, there will have been at least two reports on you, two annual reports. So all of these things count at the end of the day. Of course, I mean, there is some other vagaries or some incidental factors or some inarticulate critical premises, you know, that often don't come out to the open. But those are very, very, very scanty, where you ever get that. You know, this system is so streamlined and so structured. And that has helped us. That's why you find that in the military, you don't have grumblings or people say, oh, this man was promoted, was favored, or was promoted ahead of his colleague. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So OK, so that's that one. Then talking about what to do with uh, retired officers, generals in particular. We have a few places where we find you know, retired officers can fit into in this system. But like you said, it's got to be a structured statutory thing, not, uh, not on the basis of whether the, the chief at the time likes your face or he fixes you somewhere or something. You know, that is actually structured so that we can tap for the immense experience of these uh, retired generals. Yeah, sure. We, we've not, we don't, I mean, sincerely, we don't have a policy about reserve in our armed forces yet. But I'm sure that's one area where the new leadership could look into. Because like we're facing you know, a national security challenge right now. There are people who have so much to offer. And why those who are still serving can face the operations? They can be doing, you can form a think tank to support them on the intelligence side, on the operational side, on the political or non-kinetic side, so that they can think out. Because it's not very easy to be the one thinking at the same time be the one acting in the field. You know, these are the kind of convergence of effort that will help the nation to resolve, you know, the kind of challenges that we are facing. Okay, General. Yeah, I agree with you on that. We need to do something about that. Yes. General, there have been some emotional responses uh, to the appointment of service chiefs. Some people say some, you know, uh, senatorial zones have been better favored than others. But I've seen a short analysis by Professor uh, Kemi Rutimi of the Obafemi Awolowo University. And he is saying in that statistical analysis that between Obasanjo and now, uh, that except for the Northeast and the Southeast, other zones have been fairly served. Except for the Northeast and the Southeast. And he says that, uh, you know, between OBJ and uh, Tinubu, um, the grand summary we seem to be northwest 12, north central 9, northeast 4, southwest 8, southeast 3, south south 9. So, do you agree with his uh, summation that, uh, well, except from the northeast and southeast, between 99 and now, uh, you know, other zones have been fairly well served? And then the emotions that people have been bringing up. Oh, was, there's only one Ibo. In uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu's uh, list, oh, our own zone uh, deserves uh, more. What do you think? Should the geopolitical configuration okay, uh, they, not determine the appointment of service chiefs? Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, let, let me take you back to the question. Those numbers you were churning at, are, are they talking of number of generals or number of service chiefs? Or what, what service, chiefs. Service, chiefs. service chiefs. Service chiefs. Service chiefs. Okay. Okay. Yeah, good. So if you're talking about services, I, I don't know <laughs> I don't know where you can tell the, those numbers. Those numbers look so big. I don't know how many services we have had from 99 to now that will give those numbers is given. But uh, let me put it this way. Very easy. When you look at the spread of these current appointments, I think it's the, it's the most balanced we've ever had, you know, from 99 to now. You know, I, I remember there was a time that virtually all the services were from middle belt. <laughs> You know, between 99 and 2003, you know, middle bed and minorities and all that. But again, you know, it's a very difficult balance to strike, usually, within the system. Remember, we just talked about promotion. By the time you get to choosing service chiefs, you can only choose from the major generals. You are not going to go below major generals. So if by, by stroke of uh, coincidence or whatever, that certain parts didn't have enough major generals, at that level of the appropriate seniority at the time services are being you know, appointed, 
you, you, you are not going to manufacture one just because you want to satisfy some kind of spread. You are going to look at those within the, the seniority bracket that is you know, appropriate at that time because you are not going to do something that is going to offset the system. Okay, so, so it starts with how the people have grown within the system. We've seen it before where there were even some local governments that don't have a single mayor general in the nation. It's not anybody's fault. That one is a, you know, it's a combination of several factors. There is nothing anybody can do about that because it's not as if anybody is monitoring between second lieutenant and mayor general to know whether your own people are being represented or not. Because like I said, it's a function of so many things. If your people didn't pass their promotion exams, what's the army going to do about that? If they didn't do well in their courses, there's nothing the army is going to do about it. So all of those things that trim the system to make it uh, a pyramid, they are, there's nothing really anybody can do to deliberately you know, stage manage that, okay? But when it now comes to choosing service chiefs, you're only going to deal with the bracket of senior major generals in the system at that time, okay? So if you were already disadvantaged along the line, it will still show in that. But having said that, apart from General Alani Paula Kinri Ade, the Southwest has never really produced a chief of army staff since after him, okay? So the, this uh, Lagbaja is going to be the second person. And I, I, so we are talking about <laughs> from 60, 1960 to now, okay? So, I mean, sometimes these things could be, you know, just uh, coincidental or circumstantial, okay? So, but that is, and then of course, we also had a, a, a chief of army staff from the Southeast before, not too long, General H.J. Rickard. So, I mean, that, that was under uh, President Goodlord Jonathan. Okay, yeah, we, we know that, for example, the South is, and that's why I appreciate what the President has done in this one, by giving South is Chief of Naval Staff, which is good. So somehow, this spread is the best I've seen in a, in a long time. In a long, I think there was a deliberate effort to use this appointment to engender unity of the nation, which is something we need so badly. Because the last, for the, for the past years, that the cohesion among us have been shaken and been tested. And I think it's a, it's a very critical step uh, that has been taken to try to bring us together and give a sense of belonging to every part of the nation. Uh, so for me, uh, I, I mean, <laughs> following those uh, statistics, I think the vagaries are so many and they are beyond anybody deliberately trying to, you know, stage manage or orchestrate how it should go, you know. All right. Yeah, well, thank just, you very much. Thank you very much. Just before we let you go, there's no doubt that the new service chiefs have their work cut out for them in terms of insecurity. But I'd like to highlight um, a front page story in the Daily Trust this morning, um, spotlighting Plateau State, the killings in, in um, Plateau in the last five months. And I bring this up because you are a former commander, Special Task Force um, Operation Safe Heaven in Just Plateau. And this report states that in five months, 201 people have been killed. In May alone, 96 people were killed in June 67. The 25 circumstances in all, and a number of stakeholders have come out to speak. Some people have begun to evaluate the successes recorded by Operation Safe Heaven and what it is now, if it's still living up to its expectations or um, if it's still doing what it's supposed to be doing in just plateau. So what is going on there? Why is it difficult to manage? Why have the successes recorded in past years not been seen replicated in this year in particular? Five months since January, 201 deaths, too many. What's your assessment of this? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. That, that's a question that touches me personally because uh, Coincidentally, I was on the plateau at the time the problem in Magus uh, uh, local government started. Uh, so, of course, I, I got a brief of what started it and all of that. But uh, let, me, let me put it this way. When I got to plateau in 2012 as Commander Operation Safe Haven, I was so determined that I was going to be the last commander of that operation. I worked my heart out, you know, trying to resolve the issues. But you know what? <laughs> One verdict that came out of that effort was at the end of it, I discovered that 
that was not a, it's not a security challenge we have on the plateau. It's a political challenge. And until we address it and call it the proper name, we are not even going to be addressing the problem. It's a political challenge. There is, I've said this in, on many platforms. There is a clash of civilization in this country. Even what we call nationally a security challenge is really essentially not a security challenge. And like I said, there are inarticulate critical issues that we cannot discuss you know, on the air. But I pray that these new service chiefs will be able to lay their hands on those issues and address them. Then we'll be able to address these issues. Because it, it, it's, not, it's not security matter. You know, if those real issues are not addressed, we will continue in this vicious cycle of one person comes, you know, takes us forward, and another person comes, we go backward two steps, and, and all of that. You know, so I think that is the long and short of that. But I know the issue of uh, indigenship and settlership is there. It's very rife on the plateau. And in fact, in the middle belt as a whole, it's not just plateau. Plateau, Benway, Nasarawa, Kad uh, Southern Kaden, and all that. Those places are still the places you find all of this going. And you can understand. That's why I tell you it's not a security challenge. Because those who are doing and perpetrating this, they understand that this is an interregnum for the nation where the new government is still trying to settle down. And they're seizing the occasion to, to gain more grants, you know, you know. And all of us are watching. And so it's like, if we don't get a grasp of what the real issues are, then we are not going to be able to deploy the appropriate solutions, you know. Yeah, that, that's what I can say about that, you know. They are, they are very sensitive issues, they are very touchy issues, but until we begin that conversation of the real issues behind what we are calling security challenge of this nation, then we, are not, we have not started solving it. Well, Thank you. Thank you very much, General, for joining us on the morning show. Thank you very much. Indeed.